Welcome, welcome everybody. Greg Peterson from Urban Farm and Goodness Grows Organics in North Carolina, just side of, just outside of Asheville. And I'm here with Ms. Janice. Hello, Janice. Hello, Greg. Hi, everybody. I'm Janice Norton. I am with Urban Farm and Two Piece in a Pod, my own personal place, in Arizona, just outside of Phoenix. Cool. Tonight's class is our garden chat, Greg. I'm excited oh, yes. to be part of it this time. Yeah, normally we bring in an out an outside guest and have some kind of conversation. And uh, Janice suggested for this one that we talk about our planting method. It's a really important topic. And this is really a topic for not just your fruit trees, but really any trees. And bushes and vines. Um, and gardens for that matter. I'll mm -hmm. tell a story before we wrap up tonight. I'll tell the story of what we planted uh, or how we set up a garden bed just four hours ago. So, <laughs> I'm not this surprised. Is, this is for growing veggies. So, Well, right. welcome everybody. Um, for those of you who are in the chat live tonight, you do have access to our ongoing chat on the side. Go ahead and put your questions in there or in the Q&A. Um, connect with the community. That's what this, our resources of our chats are for, to connect, to get ideas, and to share. Um, if you're catching this as a replay in our podcast, then you're missing out. Come join us in one of our live classes. We've got live uh, seed chats and live garden chats. Greg and I are working on a new chat. I've got a good idea. We'll see if we can't get this one working uh -oh. out for next year. We already uh -oh. told you about it. You liked it too. All right, cool. Um, and it's going to be, involve more interaction with our um, our chat audience. But tonight's class nice. is hold on before you before you go past that gardenchat.org. You can sign yes. up; it's free. Um, is the seedchat.org work, Miss Janice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, brain's not on seed chat today. I put that part of the yep. brain away. <laughs> yep, seedchat.org or gardenchat.org. You can go to either one of those and sign up. And uh, get emails of our monthly happenings with all this. So, right. All right. What's the topic tonight? Tonight we're talking about the secret to guard to planting success that for the urban farm, um, and we have our little blurb for this: the secret to long-term fruit tree success and more is making sure there's enough nutrition in the planting hole for the trees and plants to thrive. So we're going to chat about the success factors that we have tested over the past uh, earlier. I wrote 30 years, but Greg and I have been talking and it's longer than that. Yeah. Greg, how many years do you have? Uh, 43 so far. I've got 43. seven. No, With... 47 for me. I planted 40... my first fruit trees in 1975. Wow. I know I don't look that old. I was a toddler, I guess. Well, I've got uh, about seven years of uh, experience actually planting. Um, more than that with the study. Um, so we're more than five decades when you put us together. Nice. We'll nice. take it. Right. Yay, yay, yay. All right. So the really the secret, the bottom line is make sure you get nutrients in the soil. So if you just dig a hole and put a tree in, and cover it back up with dirt, good luck. And this is no matter where you are. What we want to do is we want to give that tree the best limb up that we can when we plant it. And that's through adding a, a nice amount of nutrients in the hole. Here's the thing. If you fed a dog once a week, poor dog, mm -hmm. it wouldn't make it. No. If you're feeding a tree four times a year, you're not giving it enough nutrients. You need to up your game about that. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about upping our game with planting nutrients when you plant the tree and then upping your, our game with ongoing nutrients. Because here's what I've found over and over and over, over my almost 47 years of growing plants and gardens, is that the healthier the soil is, the healthier the plant is, the tastier the plant is, the more nutrient dense the food coming off, and the more resistant 
the tree is to external pests. I had somebody send me an email today and they said, what's going on with my peach tree in the desert? And it showed all these little blobs all the way down the trunk where mm -hmm. uh, some peach borer had drilled into it and the sap had dripped out and quarter size. And there must have been, what, two dozen of them hanging on this portrait? Yeah, that picture was awful. And I said, stand back 10 feet and send me a picture. And they had planted it next to a driveway in gravel. No. Right. Oh. And, you know, it's just, when but we there do might, that. There might yeah. not be a problem in somewhere else, but when you're living in the Phoenix Valley, that's like a death sentence. That's a problem. So don't do that. Do what we're going to share with you next. And one of the things that I've told people for years is expect to spend as much on nutrients and soil products the first year that you do on the tree. I just set people up right from the beginning to do that. And I've actually got the math on that. We can talk about that on the side if you want to come to me, talk to me at the lot. Yeah. There you go. For this year. So if you're only feeding your tree two times a year, one time a year, three or four times a year, you're not feeding them enough. And if you're feeding them non-organic fertilizers, it's likely negatively impacting your soil. Um, I had somebody ask me about a 10-34-0 fertilizer Oof. they wanted to put on their garden. Oof. <laughs> that 34. I, I could is, just imagine like having a dinner and having it like instead of putting vitamins on it, you're just like pouring the salt on it. Oof. That's yeah. how my reaction is. Well, there you go. Yeah. So the generally organic fertilizers have numbers like 665, 231, 444, like that. And each number that's uh let's see, nitrogen phosphorus, potassium. Did I get that in the right order? Yes. Great. Um, and when you're looking at fertilizers, first of all, if you're in the low desert, come and get the fertilizers from us because we have the best price on fertilizers for organic fertilizers that is available out there. Um, otherwise, get a fertilizer that has low numbers. 665, 323, um, those are organic fertilizers. So, yeah. All right. So, you know, we're talking about planting. We've made this really important point about making sure that there's nutrients in there. Greg, let's start with step one. You All know, right. they're going to be planting a tree or, a, uh, well, we're talking about a tree because of the roots that are necessary, but you can apply this towards many of your garden elements. Yeah. So a tree, what are we going to start with, Greg? Well, and you said tree. I just want to call this out. You can do this for every tree or bush, whether it makes food or not. And vine. And vines, exactly. And if you are going to plant a fruit tree, you definitely want to do something like this. So you start with a square hole. Why? So have you ever gotten a plant, whether it's a small potted plant or a larger plant, and you pull it out of the pot and the roots have completely circled? Yes. The pot? Yeah, they it's call, been in the pot too long. Yeah, they call that root bound. Mm -hmm. And you can actually, if you dig a round hole, if you have hard enough clay soil, if you dig a round hole, that tree will actually root Stay bind in that itself. round hole. Exactly, root bind itself in that hole. So if you are- I can swear by that because it definitely happened in my front yard. Did it? Yes. All yes. Right. I, we, we bought a house and they put the trees in before we bought it mm -hmm. and they used an auger and they dug a hole and then they put the tree in it. And I just watched that poor tree try so hard to survive and it wasn't making it. And when we pulled it out, what do you know? The roots were the same size as the original dang hole. Really? Yes. Wow, a few okay. of them managed to pop out, but not that many. They were just very sad lump of you got roots. pictures i do somewhere i'll go find them all right cool so by digging a square hole you're 
making it harder for it to root bind into that hole. Uh, uh, a tree root's not going to make a 90 degree turn. It'll work harder to get out rather than turning. Yeah. So the second thing you want to do with a hole is when you're done digging it, especially if you have hard soil, take a shovel and a pick and knock pock holes, just, you know, golf ball size holes in the side of the hole, which will also help from getting it root bound. Yeah, because it's other little pockets for the roots to go in and get stuck and they don't want to come back. They're going to start burrowing through into the soil. Yeah. This is really important if you're in an area that doesn't have loamy soil. Mm -hmm. If you have loamy soil, you're not going to have a problem. But if you're in any place that has clay soil or mm -hmm. very hard packed soil, this is going to be a critical step to not skip. Yeah. Amen to that. All right. Then step number two, I get to talk about this one. Well, hold on. We had number one was um, square hole. Square hole. Number two was pock marks in the side of the hole. So this will be number three. Okay. Number three, the next step. The next step is don't forget to do a percolation test. And this is my story to tell, because if you ever want to go take a look at what happened to me when I didn't do a percolation test, basically I dug a bunch of holes and planted a bunch of trees with some very, very good friend and my husband. And then it rained that night and I had one hole left that I wanted to do a little bit more work on, but the hole filled up and it didn't percolate the next day. And I went and looked at it and it was taking so long to percolate that I ended up pulling the trees out. So I had planted like 18 trees, I think, and I had to pull them wow. all out. That was exhausting and heartbreaking and so much more money had to be spent because I had to buy pots to put them in and I had to buy soil to put them in the pots and, and I had all the labor to do it. Oh, it was just not worth it. Just do a percolation test. Let the, the hole fill up with water, let it drain, fill it up again. And that second one should drain in 30 minutes to a couple hours, three, three hours. hours. Yeah. If you, you know, if, if it's like 20 minutes in that second one, then what you have is like sand and that's, something that you're going to want to augment with some more organic material. But if you're yeah. around the goal of like three hours, four hours, then your soil is going to percolate nice and slow, nice and perfect. Um, if it goes more than four hours, then you've probably got some clay or even something that we have in the valley called caliche, and it starts to create a problem. I went four days. So yeah, four days without drainage. It was really bad. So you definitely want to be do some augmentation and other uh, issues, you know, things to fix that. If your hole's draining in four hours, that's not bad. That's just something to note. Yeah. If it's if it's not draining in four days, that's bad. You need to mitigate that. Three, four hours is okay. That's where you kind of want to be. If you're, if you're like less than, than two hours, then you've got sandy soil and you need to augment to try and slow down the rush. I and mean, that's with organic material. If you're more than four hours, then you're going to need to maybe investigate it to make sure it's not something else, um, but it could be clay and you're going to want to fix that. We've got that a whole nother class. Do a percolation test. Do a percolation test. Exactly. So now that you know you've got good percolation, what's next, Greg? Is that mine? Yeah, that's yours, because I just got an email from somebody that said, I need the link for tonight. So I'm going to handle that real quick. While you, you take care of that. Okay. Um, so the leveling up, this is an optional step to increase your success rate. Now, this is not required. But we recommend it because we have been hearing great success stories on it. I wish I could go back and do it with my trees. Um, I've got some more trees coming this year. I'll be doing it. So basically, you're going to create a zone in the hole that's going to be good for the roots. And you're going to do that if you have a potted tree, vine, bush that you're planting. You're going to inoculate the hole with a secret sauce. And here at the Urban Farm, that's basically three caps of our fish emulsion, our kelp emulsion, our humic and fulvic acids. You're going to put all of them together in a, in a mix with one gallon water. If you're diluting it, those liquids don't react to each other. If you put just them straight together, they'll start reacting. You want to dilute it in water. So in one gallon of water, you're going to take the secret sauce. You're going to inoculate the sides of the hole 
so that the sides and the bottom are creating this, this juicy realm of goodness. And then when you plant, you're going to end up having the roots growing out to that. If you have a bare root, you can't, it's not going to do that. You don't want to do that with the bare root. What you're going to do is something different. You want to rehydrate the roots. And so you're going to take your bare root. You're going to put it in a little bath of um, uh, kelp emulsion and humic acid. Mix it together in um, four to five gallons of water. We have it in our liquids. That's essence and soul. And you're going to soak it for about 15 to 30 minutes before you plant it. And that root soak that you use, that's good for like one to three trees. The potted one is one gallon of the mixture for each hole. So that's level one. You're just going to inoculate the hole or root soak your bare roots. Next. Cool. Well, good question. I put away. I put that away. Hold on. <laughs> this is when you're mixing the stuff together in the wheelbarrow. Oh, yes. Okay, cool. So the next step is neutrifying the soil that's going back in the hole. So what we suggest is that you dig a hole that is two feet wide by two feet wide. So square two feet by two feet. And the depth of the pot, if you have it in a pot, or the depth of the pot that if it's a bare root tree, it might, the size of the pot it might be in. So generally that's about a foot. So you're gonna dig a hole one foot deep by two foot by two foot. You're gonna save 40% of the native soil. The native soil has really great nutrients in it. And if you're just trying to, as I said earlier, if you're just trying to grow in the native soil and nothing else, good luck. So 40% native soil, 60% some kind of planting mix. Planting good mix organic has organic planting mix. Yeah. It's like uh, has compost in it, worm castings in it, um, cocoa peat, some kind of something like that. If you're in the uh, if you're buying from our fruit tree program, we have Farmer Greg's planting mix that is a really good uh, product for planting trees with. So you've got your 60 40 mix. Then what you add to the 60-40 mix is two pounds of azomite or some other kind of rock dust mineral. They call it green sand or... Uh, depending where you're at. Depending on where you're at. I like azomite. There's 72 micronutrient minerals in azomite. It's, it's micronutrients, but it's already in a already pulverized granular level that it's easier for plants to uptake. Yeah, exactly. So six two, pounds of mix, two pounds of azomite, two pounds of worm castings. He's worm doing castings. number three because it's the third item. I'm doing two because it's two pounds. All right, cool. Two pounds. There we go. The third item is worm castings. Worm castings has soil life in it and it has um, nutrients in it. And it probably has worm eggs in it as well. So the worms will go to work on the soil pretty quickly, yes. If it has not dried out. So if you get worm castings, keep it moist, use it fresh, don't let it dry out. Perfect. So, and then uh, two pounds of organic fertilizer. We sell a Bioflora organic fertilizer in our Phoenix program that is a 50 pound bag of organic OMRI certified fertilizer and we sell it for $60. That is a screaming deal. If you've ever tried to buy organic fertilizer, um, it's a lot more expensive than that normally. Yes. I did some math on that. And if you're uh -huh. buying the 50 pound bag, what amount of your, what you're using to put in with your tree is only $2 and 40 cents per tree. And if you're buying the 20 pound, the 20, the 10 pound bag, you're spending $4 per tree, but it's still, it's smaller. Nice. $2 and 40 cents out of that bag is going towards planting your tree. Excellent. All right. And then two ounces of mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza is a, a soil life inoculant. And you're going to mix all of that up in the wheelbarrow. 
and then you're going to start back filling it into the hole. And what I want you to do wait, is that- Wait, wait, you mix yeah, it all in, in the wheelbarrow. And you, number five, you could look at the notes. You gotta plant the tree. That's where we're going next. Oh, okay. That's where we're going next. Yes. That's where we're going next, so, gotta plant the tree. <clears throat> Start taking the soil out of the wheelbarrow and you want to put it in the bottom of the hole. Because what I want you to do is I want you to plant the tree on a mound in the middle of the hole so that the tree roots, the root flare, they call it the root flare, that's the top of the roots, are three to five inches above grade. Hmm? Why would we do that? because of something we're going to tell you to do here in a little while. So you're going to plant the tree on a mound in the middle and then um, build a six foot diameter basin around the tree. Now and by mound, you're not talking about getting the root flare up like seven, eight inches above soil level, are you? Three or four to six inches above soil level. Yeah, you just need it just a little bit over over ground level. Yeah. And then you put your, and I call this my six, six rule. And I've done this here in, in Asheville, North Carolina, and I definitely do it in Phoenix. You build yourself a six foot diameter basin around the tree and backfill it with six to eight inches of woody mulch. And that woody mulch at the interface between the dirt and the woody mulch, it makes really, really, really good soil really fast. And there, it does some other things, which we're going to talk about here in a little while. But um, actually, another thing that it does in this case is it mitigates some of the heat as well. So you're going to mix everything in the wheelbarrow. Again, that is 40% native soil, 60% some kind of planting mix, two pounds of azomite, two pounds of worm castings, two pounds of organic fertilizer, and two ounces of mycorrhiza, all mixed up in the wheelbarrow. And then you plant your tree on a slight mound in the middle, build your basin around the tree, and then bring the woody mulch up to the height of your root flare so that you're never, never piling up woody mulch against the trunks of your trees. I, you know, I drive, I've been driving here for a year and a half now, Janice, and I'm driving around town. I <laughs> know. And I'm starting to see some trees where they've taken the woody mulch and they piled it a foot up the trunk of the tree. And so without making it wrong, I didn't do that. I went to the nursery and I was having a conversation with the, the tree person at the nursery. I said, oh, why are they doing that? And he told me, he said, well, they're just being stupid. Because that woody mulch stays wet especially here where we get four inches of rain a month. That woody oh, mulch, no. The woody mulch stays wet and it rots away the trunk of the tree. It does. It rots away the core of the, of the external uh, trunk. And it then, then that nutrient transportation system gets messed up. Yeah. Because that time. happens around the outside of the trunk, not the inside. Right. Well, when you say the outside of the trunk, between bark. the bark... The Right between, between the bark. Between the bark, exactly. That's the phloem, I think it's called from my botany days. Um, there's the nutrients. You got your trunk in the middle and your bark on the outside. And there's this nutrient flow going back and forth between the two of them. So um, Deborah wants to know, can these things be shipped out of state? Yes, uh, a lot of them can. Then liquid nutrients, if... Uh, and uh, Janice just put that information in the chat box. Yeah. All right. So we mixed it in the wheelbarrow. We planted the tree at the correct level. Um, talk to me about gophers and voles, if you would, Janice. Well, um, we have had so many people ask me about this. So we started doing some research. I've been very blessed to not have them in my space. Um, so I had to do some research and we found these that a lot of people were either creating their own or buying these thing called gopher baskets and I found a place that would get them for us at a nice wholesale rate so we can uh, uh, bring this not too expensive to us, but they have these 
flat metal baskets, these heavy duty metal baskets that come flat and then you open them up and you put them in the hole and then you plant your tree in it and you got to make sure that you fill around it and it extends up above the soil level. Mm -hmm. So it provides a barrier that the, that the burrowing animals get stuck in and they can't chew through really easy and they'll go around and change directions because those young fresh nodule of roots are really yummy and they want them so we want our roots to be able to go out and get established before the root before they get to that center core and chew out that the delicious nutrient based yummy core of roots uh, right it's not their smorgasbord. So what we do is we um, put a, a basket. Um, I found that they've got two different kinds. They've got these, these flat heavy duty ones that you can manually just kind of push out and then you put it in the ground. Um, we happen to have five gallon and 15 gallon at the pop-up right now. And then they have these other ones called speed baskets, which you can put in the ground and it's for people. It's, they created it for like landscapers and people that were like planting multiple trees at one time because it's a speedy thing to do to roll up and i'm thinking you know what this is something that's going to be really good for our um clients who some of them are older and don't want to have to try to work on the baskets um we put it in and it kind of like slides up like a stocking oh, uh, nice. around the basket yeah the trick is if you use these you have to make sure that you back fill in right around the basket really good so that you're eliminating airspace yeah. but the the gophers and the voles and the and the burrowing rodents they get stuck in that and they they get de deterred and they go on to something else something else yeah gene yeah. wants to know what about rabbits i don't think rabbits uh really do damage to the roots and they that's like, really what the gopher baskets are for. Yeah, they like burrows, but ground squirrels, they definitely do. Yeah. Um, the rabbits, I don't know, but the rabbits that I've experienced, they like to go for the young leaves rather than the roots. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And she also said coyotes. Coyotes aren't a problem. Javelinas could be a problem. They'll chew and deer. Oh my gosh, deer. <laughs> we'll come back to that one. All right, cool. That's I a have good a deer story. story. That's yeah. a good story. But all but all of the burrowing, gnawing little critters that could, you know, that the other rodents that want to go after the roots are are the ones that we're trying to deter. Yeah. All right. So now we're back up to the second part of the level up. You've already done your hole, you've done your percolation test. If you leveled up, which is optional, but highly recommended, you've created a root soak or a secret sauce for the hole or for the roots. You've mixed your soils. You've planted the tree. If it's a bare root, it's now nice and rehydrated roots and you're planted it. And now the second part is if you have the, the secret soak, the secret sauce or the root soak, you're going to pour that over your planted tree and onto the new mound of soil to help create the, the watering. This does a few things. It will help eliminate some of these small air pockets that you might have missed. If you've tamped it down, you still tend to miss air pockets. It'll get some of those, but it also doesn't waste any of those good nutrients. You go right on where those roots are, and then you're going to water the tree well. If you have a root soak and you're dividing this root soak up, that root soak is good for like one to three trees. So you'll have to recreate a new bath every three trees or so. Or so. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then water. Yeah. Water. Let's talk about watering. Um, so I've had my trees here in Asheville in the ground for six weeks now mm -hmm. and I've watered them once like I said earlier we get three to four inches of rain I've uh, set up water harvesting swales that I planted the trees in so as the mm -hmm. water runs downhill it runs into the swales and that works really well you have to really pay attention to the watering because an overwatered tree and an underwatered tree the damage looks the same they both are droopy. So you have to be paying attention to your trees. And what we suggest 
is water your plant, you water your trees once a month in the cold season and twice a month in the warm season. And if you know that you've got an extreme weather event coming, mm -hmm. whether that be a super hot, a super cold, or even a super windy, water your trees well right before that. Yeah. That will help them a lot. Yeah. And um, what what I tell people to do, and I, I learned this through observation, is... I like that. Yeah, exactly. In the cold, in the cold season, once a month in the winter. So when it's cold, one, water your trees once a month. In the warm season, twice a month. And then so for the low desert, when it gets really hot. Yes, Janice. Well, on that, if you're in the cold season and you've already watered and a freeze is coming, just top the water off a little bit. You don't need to do a deep watering, but you want to make sure that you have water in the soil because water is going to take longer to freeze than the soil will. Yeah. Perfect. So then like in Arizona, when it starts getting hot about what May 1st. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've been watering deep watering our trees and we need to talk about that deep watering here in a minute, Janice, we are deep watering our trees and um, it comes up to be, so we deep water them on May 1st and it's May 10th. This tree starts drooping. You know, at this point, you're not over watering the tree. So mm -hmm. it needs water. You can so use the moisture meter to do it, but then what's happening is there's been 10 days or so and it's starting to wilt. Then it's time. If it's day three and it's starting to wilt, no. If it's day 10 and it's starting to wilt, yeah. What we do with the high heat in the desert is if you water and the heat's kind of gradually going up, then stick to the schedule. Stick to the schedule that you have that's it, it's twice a month or maybe once every 10 days if it gets to the really, really hot days. But if you have a nice gradual and then you all of a sudden go, oh my gosh, we're jumping 15 degrees tomorrow. It's going to be a whole lot, whole lot, I almost cussed, a whole lot higher in, in you know, the next day water that evening so that your tree is protected for the next few days. And then when yeah. it comes down, so the gradual temperature change our plants are used to and they're ready for. But when you have a dramatic temperature change or something comes in and you've got all these really dry winds or constant winds, cold winds or hot winds, but if they're, if they're intense and they're drying, then you can water it to protect for those two. Deborah wants to know how long do you water for? Don't know. It Can't depends. answer that. It depends. I came up with a really great email to somebody and I want to go find that. Okay. So a great answer for that. what we have to have you do is make sure you deep water your trees. <laughs> if you have really sandy soil, it's going to take less water because it'll, it'll go deep quicker. <laughs> if you have... Um, really clay soil, it's going to take longer. And I like uh, what Janice does. Janice will t do a deep water over two days. She fills the basin around her tree, lets it sink in. And then the next day she fills it again to let it sink in. So that's that way the water is getting down into the soil. Did somebody come to the lot just the other day and she says that she's really excited about her trees. She's she, They're doing really well, but she's a little bit concerned about the watering. She's got them on a schedule. She's watering them once on Monday and once on Wednesday. She didn't want to change that. She really felt like she, they were getting enough water. I said, let's change one thing then. Let's change one thing. Instead of doing it once on Monday and once on Wednesday, let's do it Monday, Tuesday. Let your trees get your water Monday, Tuesday, because she was getting salt burn, which is mm -hmm. the, the, it was showing up on, on the ground and it was showing up in the trees. I said, let the water soak in one day and then go the next day, push other water on top. You'll push the salts down. It's equivalent of watering once a week. It just happens to be spread out over two days. Perfect. And then her trees have a chance to dry out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You're going to, you, you had something, you, did you find it? No, I, I just go me a moment. All right, cool. So um, 
you you're basically you're flooding flooding the basin around your tree then the next thing we want you to do is we want you to shade the tree shading the tree starts with the woody mulch the six to eight inches of woody mulch around the base of your tree insulates the soil and at the interface between the dirt and the woody mulch it starts making soil really well really quickly and really well and it acts like a sponge to keep the soil around the tree cooler. So that's the first layer of, of shading your tree. The second layer of shading your tree, and we'll get to you in a minute, Janice. Mm -hmm. The second layer of shading your tree is either wrapping or painting the trunk of the tree. And... Um, Wrapping, we sell a tree wrap that is a cloth tree wrap. This is especially important in the desert where it's the sun is so intense. But you know what I'm finding here, Janice? The sun's pretty intense here too. Well, I'm not surprised. Um, so, so wrap your tree trunk with a tree wrap or paint it. But we're not a fan of paint tree paint. No. Um, it's chemicals. You don't really want to put chemicals on your tree. What do we like to paint our trees with, Janice? See, even the basic tree safe ones that we find in the store, we're just really not a big fan of it. We found, Greg likes to call it by this other name, but we called biodynamic tree paste. Mm -hmm. It's basically a combination of fertilizer and probably kennel and clay, depending on where you go in. And it goes, you know, see, IV organics. And it protects against the the sun. It protects against insects. Insects. It protects against rodents. It's just a real, and it gives nutrients into the trunk at that place. Exactly. This is a nutrient that you're painting the tree trunk with. What I'm holding is called IV Organics. It's a three in one plant guard. It's not cheap. This is a, a pint it's can not. for fifty bucks. It's so not cheap. Biodynamic tree paints aren't cheap, but they're really effective. I actually found out about ding, ding. them uh, 20 years ago when I went to a um, uh, urban farming event in California. It was a three-day educational event, and they call it poo paint, P-O-O-P-A-I-N-T, because they were taking manure and clay and water and straw and mixing it up in a bucket and just slathering it on their trees. This is going to be more effective on trees with thinner bark, like our citrus trees and some of our younger um, deciduous trees. But if you mm. have a tree that has a thick bark, it's not going to be that so effective on it. Oh, sure it will be. Thick, Hold not on. that effective. They don't, need, it. they don't need the sun protection as much. Oh, got it. Right, exactly. Okay, so but, maybe not, the, maybe effective isn't the word, that necessary. It's not going to be that necessary for the trees with the really thick bark because they don't need the sun protection. But they'll however, still benefit from the nutrients. Yes, it'll benefit from the nutrients and tree borers. If you yes. paint them with this stuff, it helps keep them away. Yes. I have the answer for the water. I wrote this out for somebody. Um, they were looking at drip circles. Can I okay. answer that one? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. They were looking at drip circles and how how long should they allow it to work? And my answer was, it depends. Because, you know, uh, we created these drip circles, um, which are basically uh, uh, rings that have multiple emitters in them so that you can get the water to go the entire area instead of just one or two areas, um, but it doesn't matter how you water your trees. You still need to check the depth of moisture with a soil probe the next day after you water. Until you get into the rhythm of knowing exactly what your trees need, this is how you learn. You water, and then the next day you check with a soil probe to see um, if the moisture got down far enough. Mm. This means if the tree, if you had a regular sized tree, you're looking at about a foot and a half to two feet for the young ones, a little bit two feet or more for the older ones, up to three feet. Um, if your soil probe is not going down that far, 
then for the next watering, extend it like 30 minutes and test again to see if you're getting to that point where that watering is going deep enough. If you've got a two day watering like I do, then wait till after the second day and test it. Or you can wait after the first day and see if you need a longer watering the second day or a shorter watering. That's how the soil probe tells you if you've gone down far enough. The moisture meter will tell you if, the sto if your soil is still, you tested and it's showing in the moist zone the day before a scheduled watering, if you have a, a timer, you go out and you check it, it's supposed to go water on Tuesday, you check it on Monday, and if it's still moist, don't water. Yeah. Don't water, because your trees don't need it. They need airspace. All right. So that was that question. Um, Brox, right. are we doing questions yet? No, we're back to uh, the shading lesson. the tree. Okay. Yeah, shading the tree, and then we'll get to questions. So shading your tree, woody mulch, number one, wrap the tray or paint the trunk, number two. By the way, Jean said IV Organics uh, is $40 on Amazon. Um, number three, plant a ground cover around your tree. This is especially important in the hotter climates. Uh, we give away cow peas at our fruit tree program events because uh, they grow wild in our yards in Phoenix anymore. So we give them away. They're a nitrogen fixer and they shade the soil. They can drop the soil temperature 50 degrees in the summer. That's enough to really have, cool. your, tr yeah, in have our, your tree in our survive. Area, yeah. yeah, exactly. Or um, um, sweet potatoes or plant sweet potatoes. And both of them are edible. So yeah. There you go. All right. So let's just review real quick. Square hole, dual percolation test, 60% planting mix, 40% uh, native soil with two pounds of azomite, two pounds of uh, organic fertilizer, two pounds of worm castings, and two ounces you. of myco. Mix it all up, plant on the mound in the middle, put your woody mulch around the base of the tree. Um, do your water secret tree, sauces. Water well before you put your wood chips down. It's just, it's easier to see. Yep, exactly. All right, there you go. Okay. There it is in a nutshell. And in the middle there, you can do your mm. level up and be optional on that one. All right, let's go for our questions because let's make sure we get this. Um, Roxana asks, um, thank you for all the education. It's sensational. Thank you. How about the opposite situation? If the water filters too quickly through the soil, what is it to do? If your soil is too sandy, you need more organic material. You need to put in more compost or more planting mix. Keep adding the woody wood chips so that you can keep building the soil. Um, you can add worm castings. Um, what you need to don't, you can maybe ease back on the azomite because that's just minerals and it's washing through, but you need the organic material so that it's something that can be, that can soak up the water. Sand mm -hmm. does not soak up water. Organic material will soak it up. Yeah. Excellent question. Roxana also wants to know, can you comment on woody mulch? Which woody mulch is okay? I read that pine chips are very acidic. How do you choose? Here's the thing. Pine chips are more acidic, but a lot of woody mulch and organic matter normalizes the pH of the soil. So I am a big fan of whatever you can get. The big question in Phoenix was oleanders and uh, palm trees. And it all breaks down. It breaks down to healthy soil eventually, just like it does in the forest. So I'm a fan of whatever woody mulch you can get, take. Yes, Janice. As long as it's not treated. True. You don't want oh, yeah. painted, you don't want treated. Yeah, we do, we do get this a question question occasionally. What about sawdust from uh. from <laughs> some kind of mill or something? As long as it is wood sawdust, if they're cutting things like treated wood or um, faux wood, you don't want that. No, you need to make sure that. it is untreated wood. And while we're on the topic, never, never, never use pallets in your garden i drove by i drove by a mulch yard the other day mm -hmm. 
and they were mulching, they were chipping pallets. Oof. Pallets are treated with multiple different kinds of chemicals to keep termites away, to keep um, all sorts of bugs away, all, all sorts of bugs away and anti flame retardants. Yeah. Which you don't, you don't want that. So yeah. Gene says uh, chipdrop.com. Yep. They're great. Uh, they've been on our podcast. Uh, they can get you free woody mulch in some instances. Depends where you're at. Anonymous asks, what if the worm castings freeze? Are they still okay? Yes. Yep. Some of the life may have died in it, but the nutrients will be great for them. Yeah. The end result is there. Public Works, City of Avondale. Hello, Public Works, City of Avondale. I love it that they're here. Are they? Says says that's in the chat oh, nice. says do they make untreated pallets yes they do make untreated pallets and there's some look it up on the internet there's some kind of marking system that they they spray paint on there or they mark them etch on the pallets um i do have to say that i was out in either peoria or avondale right before i left phoenix and rather the in the median Rather than putting gravel in the medians, they've transitioned to putting woody mulch in the medians. I've seen stories about that elsewhere, not just here. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, exactly. A doc farmer. Hello, doc farmer. Just saw you. Um, how do you plant the cow peas? Do you just throw them under the mulch? You can, and they should take care of themselves, or you can pull back the mulch a little bit or find a, a, a dirt spot and plant one there um, so that you can maybe even put a little uh, planting mix in there and cover it back up with the wood chips. It'll be happy as here's long as it gets the water. Here's what I, well, and it can't go directly in the wood chips. Here's what I suggest you In the soil within the wood yeah, chips. Make a little divot, maybe the size of, you know, six inch diameter, six inches deep, plant them there the first time. And then what I found is, in fact, the new owners of the urban farm, uh, I, I was talking to Ryan the other day and he said to me, Greg, these dang cow peas are coming up everywhere. So they're easy to pull. They're not invasive, but they no, do they're... like to grow. Yeah. I, when I created hmm. my six inch or six foot basins, I had no wood chips down. I had the ground and I had planted the trees on a little mound and I had leftover soil and I used it to create a ring around the tree so that that was the basin because I had intended to cover everything with wood chips. I needed to have like a little basin around each tree. And then when I filled the basins with the wood chips, I planted my sweet potatoes in those little rings of soil at the edge of my six foot basins. And then I planted wood chips around the basins as well. So you kind of lost the basins, but I had the rings to do the effect of keeping the water and wow my sweet potatoes went off like crazy oh they loved it yeah there you go alicia has a good great question thank you for asking this alicia she says a lot of your knowledge from working in the is from working in desert environments can uh can be applied for the desert environments what about other areas um so what i'm learning alicia is that the planting methodology that we use in Phoenix works in Asheville. It's still about adding no nutrition to the soil when you plant your trees. And I went ahead and I've checked with other people here in a much cooler climate than Phoenix. I've checked with other people here uh, that about the nutrients in the hole and the woody mulch around the hole. Also, the woody mulch around the hole makes it easier to pull weeds out. Yes, it does. And I'm going to, I, I they will They have be... to work so hard to get through the mulch mm -hmm. that they don't have that much of a root base. Yeah. And I will be continuing to add woody mulch. In fact, I've got about 100 cubic yards in my front yard right now. Right over, right over there. They, uh, I've got the tree services trained to drop in my yard. It's really cool. Yeah, it's really nice. cool. So there you go, Alicia. All right. Can you comment on protecting the tree during winter in Phoenix? 
Well, Roxana, if you're talking about a deciduous tree, what you actually want to do is um, remove the leaves if you need to. You want the cold to get into the trunk because the trunk of the tree needs to absorb the cold. Um, the roots themselves, we want to protect from freezing. We don't get that too much in Phoenix. Every once in a while you do yeah. it. Maybe some of the higher elevations outside of Phoenix might get a freeze. Um, but if for some reason we get enough of a weather change, you should know this. If we start to get a hard freeze, you're going to want to make sure that the soil is moist because the water will uh, take a long time to freeze and that will protect the roots. It ends up... And sharing the cold and the heat throughout the whole body of water. In 47 years of growing fruit trees in Phoenix, I planted my first one in, two th in 1975 yes. in Phoenix. I never lost a tree to cold. Now, that being said, now you the, said kinds, of, the kinds of trees that, there you go, the kinds of trees that we're planting are deciduous bare root trees deciduous trees that go dormant in the winter and citrus. You would probably have a problem with some tropicals. I didn't ever really grow tropicals. Um, although mangoes and guavas and papayas I grew in Phoenix and I didn't have a problem with them in Phoenix. So there you go. Uh-oh. Arizona weather forest is calling for a very cold winter mm -hmm. this year, likened to 1913. Learn the skills. Now, there you go. Oof. I'm going to do some research on that. All right, cool. Let's see here. Gene says, can purslane or other ground covers grow under citrus trees? They are good for chickens. Yes, absolutely. Purslane is good. And uh, cowpeas, the chickens love the cowpea leaves as well. When do you start to paint or wrap the trees? That is an excellent question. Gene had that question, Greg. March. You're going to basically allow your deciduous trees to start to form their buds so you can tell where the branches are coming because you don't want to stop those. Um, you're going to allow the buds to grow and you're going to wait to get to the point where you need to protect that, that bark from the sun. So when it's starting to get warm in April, so you're going to plant it and you're going to protect it in March. What about citrus trees? Citrus trees in March. March. Yeah, that's good. And, you know, if you're in Minnesota, I think that's where uh, Alicia is, if I, my memory serves me. And here in uh, Asheville, uh, I would wrap the trunks or paint the trunks with a biodynamic tree paste. Uh, but wrapping them for uh, sun protection is, I haven't experienced that that's an issue. Um, somebody in the chat said, tell us about your deers. So, <laughs> your deer story. Oh, this is a great story, by the way. So about six weeks ago, we're planting, we start our next round of fruit trees and we plant six trees, four apples, a, a peach and a plum. Get them planted in the ground one Saturday, we're planting 50 more the following Saturday. So we get all those planted up and I go out on Thursday, like four or five days after I planted them and they've been completely stripped. Oh no. The deer completely stripped them. Didn't kill the trees, just ate all the leaves. And this is Thursday, Saturday, we're planting 50 more trees. So I get on the phone with Scott Murray. Scott Murray's my organic gardening farming coach and or an uh, avocado farmer in San Diego. And I said, Scott, what do I do? And he came up with the solution. And it's literally a solution. I added a, uh, probably four ounces of cayenne pepper and I ground it up to water and I mix it up real good. And then I added some liquid garlic about four ounces of liquid garlic into four gallons Spicy. of my backpack sprayer. And I, so we planted on Saturday and 
I sprayed everything but the mulberries that we planted. Thinking because you the, forgot about them, right? No, I just didn't think they would be interested in the mulberries. I came out Sunday morning and the mulberries were stripped. But every other tree, and so we planted about 40 stone fruit tree, you know, like peaches, plums, blueberries, those kinds mm -hmm. of things. I planted those. They didn't touch the ones I had sprayed. Score. So the solution is uh, like an ounce of cayenne pepper and an ounce of liquid garlic per gallon. And I actually added uh, fish emulsion, kelp emulsion, and humic acid to the backpack sprayer at the same time. So, so you're getting I'm, nutrients galore. I'm getting nutrients. I'm fertilizing them, for, foliar fertilizing them at the same time. And this electric backpack that I have, the backpack is battery powered. You rave about this. 15 minutes, I did my entire orchard of 150 trees in 15 nice. minutes. It was nice. absolutely amazing. So that that um, helped a lot. Oh, one more thing. So the in the liquid, if you're just using cayenne pepper and garlic, you need to add some kind of soap. Uh, so just a, a tablespoon of soap per gallon. That makes it the nutrients, the cayenne and the garlic stick better. But with the fish emulsion and kelp emulsion, that does the same thing. It's a little bit oily. You have to write an article on this with the recipe and we'll put it in the root camp. All right, cool. Somebody wants to know, Deborah wants to know, where do you get liquid garlic? It is called, uh, I'll look it up. Go ahead and take the next question, we'll Janice, but I'll look it up. All right. At the beginning of the chat, you mentioned fertilizing four times a year is not enough. How can we improve the nutrition of the tree? How about spraying for possible pests? What is your opinion of berm oil? I'm not sure about, I know about neem oil, I don't know about berm oil. Okay, let's start with, yes, we tell you, you need to fertilize four times a year with organic fertilizer. This is an absolute must for the level one basic care, but that's not enough. You wanna start your tree off. So we're talking about adding the organic fertilizer, and the worm castings and the azomite and the mycorrhiza in the hole when you plant. That's to get your roots, your tree off on the right root, so to speak. Then you're going to drench feed and foliar feed. So you're going to give your tree monthly treatments of some sort of nutrient in the soil and on the leaves to help it grow, to help it soak it in. Um, now, the key is, if you're going to be doing this type of fertilizing, which we hope is the only type of fertilizing you do, stick to organics. Yes. If you try to do this with something that's not organic, you're going to be overwhelming your tree with something. If your tree does survive the non-organic, it may become, for lack of a better word, addicted. Um, and it won't be able to use the natural organic stuff the way it's supposed to. So don't don't confuse your tree with inorganics. Use organics and feed it monthly in a way. Feed it bi-monthly during if you can, if the with the foliar feeding, if you can. If you can't do bi-monthly, which is twice plus, a month, do monthly. Plus, non-organic fertilizers can negatively impact the health of the soil. Oh yes. All right, we're going to wrap this up in five minutes. We've been going for an hour and two minutes so far, Janice. I believe it. Um, Alicia says, uh, do espaliered fruit trees need the same six-foot diameter when planting? Yes. Six You're building the wide. soil. If you can, whatever is the best you can do. Mm -hmm. You know, if, in the spot, if you want to go three foot wide and six feet long, that's great. Two foot, but the bigger, the better. Absolutely. Roxana, neem oil is very specific. It has specific uses. I'd love to talk to you about it more, but um, it's not an all applicable thing. It, it just does certain things. We'll come back to that in another class. Gene and, says, Gene says, what about inline fertilizing? Talk about it, Janice. I have one. I actually have two. I have two different kinds in my yard. Um, the, the, def, the inline one is great. It's beautiful. You, however, are putting in a higher concentration of your liquids and then water goes into them and pulls out what's needed to 
run down the line. Be careful what you mix in there. You, If you are using for our products, you will use just heart in this line. You don't want to add this, the essence or the soul at the same time that you're using heart. You're going to want to rinse it out or something. So if you are going to do what we recommend during the summer of once a month with heart and then the other you know, mid-month with essence and soul during the summer, do the essence and soul manually. Don't put the essence and soul in your inline. They In those higher concentrations, they tend to foam up. But I love them. I love, love, love them. Um, Greg is typing an answer for another one. Uh, not about trees, but if you have time, I have a question about diatomaceous earth. I was trying to fight earwigs this spring, but it didn't deter them at all. Then it was different types or grades, and I wondered if perhaps I got the wrong kind. I think I had food grade. I'm not sure about this answer, Greg. I am. I, that's why you get to answer it. There you go. So yes, food grade is polished diatomaceous earth. You want the kind of diatomaceous earth that is garden grade or in um, uh, pool filters. It's oh, got rough right. edges. Exactly. It's the rough it's, edges of it that. It scars them up scratches yep, exactly. them up and it goes through their 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 underbellies and mixes them up so they can't it gets them all right everybody well thank you one more thing uh where do you get the liquid garlic it is called mosquito barrier um and they sell it by the quart or the gallon and it works apparently it works for keeping mosquitoes away but i've been using it for uh fleas and ticks to keep fleas and ticks away out of our yard. Um, and it's 99% liquid garlic. Which so means organic. It, which means or it's no, there's no chemicals. It's organic. Nice. I started nice. typing to AC. Um, do you have any resources on what to expect or how to deal with issues the first year after planting? I keep seeing unexpected things with peach and orange trees that planted the, within the last year but I don't really find great resources for what is normal. So you're in Phoenix, they're in Phoenix area. And so they're in the scope of our fruit tree program. Um, you can always email me with pictures and questions. That's what we do for the Phoenix metropolitan area for people that get trees from us. You can send us an email. I'll give you the email in the uh, as a response here is for that. Really quick, Marnell is in the chat room. I want to say thank you. I had a great time chatting with Marnell today. We did a, a personal consult. Um, we have opened up our consult so that people can come and chat with us for an hour and we give you a little bit more, a definitely more personalized answer. I would love if Marnell would uh, put in the comments what she thought about it, but if you are interested, you can find more at theurbanfarm.as.me. Again, that's theurbanfarm.as.me. Why are you shaking your head? Because it needs to be, why don't you just send them to our urbanfarm.org website? There's a page on there and it's easier to remember. So, um, Urbanfarm.org, there's a page on urbanfarm.org? For the consults, there is. Absolutely. Anyways, oh. we do consults. Janice and Ray and I do all do consults. If you want a water harvesting consult, you can get me and Don Titmus. Um, uh, somebody asked what the liquid barrier is, or the garlic, liquid garlic. It is called Mosquito Barrier. That is the brand name of it. Mosquito Barrier. All right, kids. Oh, what do you know? Urbanfarm.org slash consults. I did set up a page. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, that's oh. just Greg. Yeah, we need to fix that. So it's no, all actually, it, I need to update the page, but I do have one. Go there. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, okay, we got Katrina. Uh, Roxana says, thank you both. It's fun to learn from you. Yes. Thank you. So we have... When we do our nursery and, and our business, we have three rules. The first rule is be safe. The second rule is have fun. Have fun. If we're not having fun, when you come to visit us on the fruit tree lot and when you come to our classes and stuff, we're having fun. It's like, let's do this. If we're not having fun, why do it? Why bother? And the 
third rule is the one that I always break, which is don't touch Janice's purple pen. Yeah, there you go. I always and Greg steal takes it. my purple pen because he's having because he's <laughs> living up to rule number two. There you go. All right, kids. Thank you so much. We had a blast with you. This will yeah. be on the podcast next month. Um, I will also take a copy of this in the morning and I'll put it in root camp. I think that would be a good one. Yeah, perfect. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Thank you.